Tonight's episode contains intense scenes of a mature nature and may not be suitable for children under 16. Previously on the Harry Strange radio drama. In the top drawer of a dresser larger than my office, I found my wallet and dagger of Yago. That was a good sign. I just wish I could remember how I got here. The view was spectacular. Small, narrow streets opening up to the occasional plaza. Then I saw it and did a double take. The hair on my arms stood up and I felt a knife cut into my belly. I sat down because my legs were too weak to hold me. Mmm. Nice pecs. Oh. What have we here? Her fingers slowly rubbed the scar, then moved over to my nipples, which she rolled between her thumb and forefinger. Fiona dropped her towel. She was close enough that her nipples brushed my chest. Mmm. Am I pert enough for you? Once our Pope is seated, he will declare all non-Catholics heretics. He will give all fornicators, divorcees, baby killers, and other heathens one week to attend confession or begin their conversion to Catholicism. That Sunday, Catholic churches around the world will explode. The following week, while the world is still reeling from this devastation, we do the same thing to the synagogues, mosques, and the Bible-thumping churches. The Israelis will blame the Muslims and use this opportunity to attack Iran, Syria, and Jordan. Iran will return fire, no doubt causing Israel to escalate to nuclear warfare. And that is where it all comes together. The other Arab nations will be obligated to join their brothers against the Jews. And the dam would be a military target that the Israelis would exploit. It would cut off the power and water supply in Damascus and most of the other cities in the country. Happening now on the Harry Strange Radio Drama. Ooh. <laughs> a man of action. I approve. Making love to Fiona uh, was exciting and intense. Oh, there was as much scratching oh, and biting as oh, there was kissing. Uh, that's it, lover. She was encouraging uh, and enthusiastic. Uh, that's the spot. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, 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 For all of Fiona's endearing qualities, she was also an unnatural. She wasn't going to great lengths to hide it, but she wasn't wearing a sign about it either. I knew about the sign because, well, there wasn't much of Fiona that I hadn't seen. I decided to let her keep her secret for now. That was incredible. (laughs) I bet you say that to all the boys. Not so much. Wow. I haven't felt like that in ages. I may have to keep you around a little longer. Am I going somewhere? Well, you seem pretty anxious to find your friend. Finney, right? He's more of an associate. But he did save my life, and I owe him one. I'll make a few calls. Plus, we are in Rome. How did you know we are in Rome? I'm a detective. It's what I do. Well, that, and I looked out the window while you were in the shower. We're just outside of Vatican City. I can see the Dome of St. Peter's from our suite's window. Care to explain? Explain? The archer was in Night Falls, in the U.S. I wake up in Rome. I'm all for putting some distance between me and those who would kill me, but crossing an ocean? That's a bit much. And here I was thinking we were going to have to talk about how many lovers we've had and whether or not we like puppies. Isn't this so much better? Besides, do you really want to know the number? No. You'll just inflate yours to make you sound more manly, and I'll just decrease mine to sound less slutty. Really? I like slutty. Everyone does. That's what gets men into so much trouble. As much as I love the turn this conversation has taken, I really want to know why we're in Rome. Tell you what, lover. Get a shower, get dressed, dinner is on me, and I will answer all your questions there. Promise? Yes. And if you're very good, I'll show you my slutty side later. Magic and magical people, the unnatural order is all around us. There are white witches, black witches, demons, vamps, werewolves, shapeshifters, ghosts... It's a protoplasmic party of creature features out there. But unless you know where to look, you won't find them. I know where to look. My name is Harry Strange. Hello? Hello? There's someone there. 
I know you must think things are desperate to do what you've done. Come and talk to me. I'm sure we can find a better solution than this. You can still be forgiven by me and the Father. I am doing the Father's will and require no forgiveness, Your Holiness. Kidnapping the Bishop of Rome is not doing the Father's work or will. It is when the Pope has lost sight of the Church's mission. So, Deo, correct? I'm sure you didn't kidnap me to discuss ecclesiastical epistemology. What do you want? I want you to call a special conclave and read this statement. You realize this statement will turn the world against Catholics? We don't need the world, Your Holiness. Just the faithful. I am not reading that. I understand. You have your legacy to think about. You will read this one to the world instead. I will not resign. I have been selected by God for my role as Pope. You were selected by the College of Cardinals. Through divine inspiration. I will not resign because of a renegade brother. Perhaps your holiness needs a stronger incentive. Acolyte, please bring out the newest penitent to the Order of the Dagger and the Cross. Here is a little drool monster. Aloysius? Uncle Joseph? Yay! The brother told me I can be an acolyte like you were. Maybe someday the Pope. What did you do to his mother? She would have never given him to you willingly. I showed her the letter your holiness wrote and so thoughtfully sealed with your personal mark. She was overjoyed that young Aloysius was accepted into a Jesuit order. Brother Sordeo scares me a little. There's no reason to fear me, little one. Just ask your uncle to read a note at church this Sunday. You're a vile man, Sordeo. My nephew has the understanding of a seven-year-old. He hasn't any idea what you are asking. What does the note say, uncle? Nothing more than his holiness wants to spend more time with his family. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have your uncle home with you and your mother? Yes! Is it true, uncle? I'm sorry, Aloysius. I have a higher vocation that I must obey. Not even for your only nephew? Pity. Acolyte, secure Aloysius. You monster! Release him! I am inspired. The will of God flows through me. Acolyte, the spike. Be sure to use the gloves. That steel is glowing orange. Careful. Now bring it here. Can you feel that heat? And it's still a foot away. Bring it closer. Look how the hair on the acolyte's arm singes. Imagine that spike thrust into your chest. Or your eye. Please, don't hurt uncle. Please! You can torture me, but it won't change anything. Have pity. Don't make the boy watch. Torture you? Oh no, your holiness. You are the holy see. Torturing you would displease the father. Oh no. Where first? I think the leg. No, that's hot! Get it away from me! Please, uncle, please, make them stop! Sir Dale, no! No! Please, it burns! Oh, uncle, make them stop! Why are they kneeling me to the chair? Uncle, do something! Please! <laughs> I'm sorry, Harry. I don't mean to laugh. You look dapper in that suit. Giacomo should tailor all of your clothes. Hey, really? The women in here can't keep their eyes off of you. A couple of the men, too. Oh, Harry, that expression on your face? You look like a piece of bacon in a room full of dogs. I was trying to relax, but we were in a dance club so dark I could barely see my hand in front of my face. I had nowhere to put my back because Fiona insisted on a table overlooking the dance floor. Musically, I was more of a Tony Bennett kind of guy. I'm not sure what this style of music was called, 
But I was certain it was what people must listen to just before they walk into their local Jiffy Mart with an automatic weapon. I have to use a little girl's room. Promise to be here when I get back? I can't promise anything after five minutes. If you stay, later, I'll show you a trick I learned from a Filipino stripper. She licked my ear and walked away, still giggling. Her dress was a deep blue gauze-like fabric, sheer enough to see that she was wearing thong panties but not a bra. I couldn't guess the height of the heels she wore. I hadn't figured out Fiona's game yet. I suppose she didn't have to have a game, but as an unnatural, it was unlikely she was on the upside of honesty. Something about her made my head tingle. And not the lower one, and not in a good way. She's quite beautiful, no? She is quite beautiful, yes. Who are you? Marcella. Pleased to meet you. I'm Harry. Harry? Harry. Harry Strange. So what can I do for you? From the looks of you, much. But for now, I need you to come with me. I'm sorry, I'm here with the beautiful woman. Perhaps we should wait for her to come back. A tiny revolver appeared in her hand. It's very important that you come with me. Are you going to shoot me? A blonde girl walking near the table fell to her knees, a red spot appearing in the center of her dress. Marcella picked her up and slid her into the booth across from me. The speaker system in the club muffled the gunshot. I jumped up, but she pointed the gun at my head. I have five more rounds in here. Do you want me to shoot four more innocents, or will you come with me? I followed Marcella out of the club and into a black caddy that was waiting outside. In the light, Marcella looked older than she did in the club. Older and much more dangerous. She never took the gun off me. Do you want to talk about this? Anything that I can say would only sound crazy. You need to talk to someone wiser than I. Your boss have a name? It would be kind of silly if she didn't. She? Good to know. At least I'm dressed to impress. Silk suits will not impress her. She wants to know what you have on the inside. Same as everyone else. Nothing special there. But that's not really true, is it? You're very special. A champion, some might say. Is that what you would say? I say nothing. I only do as I'm directed. Turn around, please. Are you going to shoot me in the back? Do you plan to be a problem for me? No. I want to see where this ride ends. I believe you now turn around. I turned around, facing the window which was, no doubt, heavily tinted on the outside. In the reflection of the window, I saw Marcella shuck off her cocktail dress. She was wearing a white bra and white panties. Suddenly, I felt like a peeping Tom. I looked away. You may turn around. Marcella was wearing a simple black robe. If I didn't know any better, I'd say it was a nun's cassock. I stood outside the car for a second. When Marcella got out, she was wearing the coif of a nun. Is it Sister Marcella? And you said you weren't special. Good observation. Then you didn't really shoot that blonde at the club. I did shoot her. It was a half-load like they use in the movies. And the blood? A squib. That was Sister Jennifer. She's a former special effects intern. She took her final vows with us a month or so ago. She was eager to help. What about the other five slugs? Let's just go inside, Mr. Strange. The Mother Superior of our Order is waiting to speak with you. I appreciate you coming on such short notice, Mr. Strange. Do all Mother Superiors have a taste for irony, or is that just your particular gift, Sister Judith? Fine. I was never big on small talk. I want you to see something. Marcella, please. Sister Judith handed Sister Marcella a DVD. You must understand, Mr. Strange, that I once supported the Council. I am still sympathetic to their goals, but their means... This is the Order of Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrow? Isn't that the same order as the orphanage that was destroyed in the U.S.? Yes. I sanctioned it. You ordered the killing of those children? No! The building was supposed to be empty. I would never have allowed the children to be hurt. Marcella was behind me. The nose of a thirty-eight sticking into the back of my neck. Do you really want to find out if they are full loads? Please sit down. Get to the point, sister. Please do sit down, Mr. Strange. I haven't any desire to have you shot. You need to understand what you are up against. The type of fanatics you are going to fight. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Speaking of which, my date is going to be pretty PO'd that I've gone missing. You'll fight. But you have to fight for the right reasons. The world is in a precarious place. Economic devastation, riots, crime at an all-time high. An increasing divorce rate, deviant sexual behavior, and fornication becoming the norm. Hey, ease up on the fornication. Abortion is birth control. And the list goes on. Some of us decided it was time for a cleansing. We banded together with the hopes of giving the world a wake-up call. You were planning a great revival? 
Nothing so Protestant, but yes, a reawakening of the Catholic faith, a return to the four truths of Catholicism. A crusade? An inquisition? Hasn't the church tried this before? It wasn't supposed to be like that. It was going to be a spiritual awakening, a cleansing of evil. Which explains the holy oil and salt mixture at the orphanage. Tell me, were there many cloaked demons among the children? No, but one among the sisters. Even we have been infiltrated. But that isn't the point. Mr. Strange, the apocalypse is coming. Do you know how many times a year I hear that? But how many times have you heard it from a nun who holds a position like mine? She had me there. The Catholic Church was essentially an old boys club when it came to management. Especially upper management. Sister Judith didn't get to be the nun in charge of a worldwide order by buying into doomsday prophecies. Sister Marcella had her back against the window and was watching my reactions. I couldn't decide if she was bluffing about the shells in her gun. I had a meeting with some of the most powerful clergy of the Catholic Church who are planning the launch of the apocalypse. Isn't there a line about no man knowing the hour of the day? Something like that. But there aren't any rules about forcing the Father's hand. How does one force God into doing anything before he's ready? Exactly. Okay, now you aren't making any sense. The men on this council believe if they create an event so catastrophic, so utterly destructive, they can force God into action. Or, at the very least, humans will turn to the church for protection. That takes some ba... hubris. If it ended there, I wouldn't have sent for you. But they are planning nothing short of World War III and breaking a seal imprisoning Gog and Magog. You just lost me again. Marcella, a coffee please, Mr. Strange? Rum and Coke. Hold the Coke. Fine. Just water. Sister Judith wove quite a tale. When she started to explain the geopolitical realities of the Middle East, I started thinking about Fiona's breasts. Then I started thinking about Marcella's breasts. I'm not a political guy, and I don't pretend to understand the nuances of the relationships between Israel and her Arab neighbors. However, when she got to the part about nuking open a seal and freeing two elder gods capable of taking out a tenth of the world's population, my focus became razor sharp. How does the Catholic Church pledging allegiance to a couple of elder gods force God's hand? It's a ploy. A double cross. That's a dangerous game to play. It gets worse. You and Lilith are the sacrifices necessary to put Gog and Magog under the rule of Sordeo. Why us? Perhaps because you are both unnaturals. Easy there, toots. I'm as natural as you are. Mr. Strange, for all the things you are, a natural is not one of them. You may have been at one time... But those days are long behind you. I've done my research. Regardless, unnaturals are the bad guys. I kill the bad guys. Except this time, you didn't. As I understand it, you delivered Lilith to Sordeo. You practically gift-wrapped her. Are you trying to imply I knew this was going to happen? That this was part of my grand design? Why the hell would I want to be a sacrifice? Martyrdom is quite common among cult members. Why did you bring me here? Because... Sister Judith, turn on the television. Marcella looked as if someone had whacked her in the jaw with a tire iron. Her face was ashen white, and she was about a breath away from tears. On the screen was a newsreader with red eyes. A still photo of the Pope was in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. According to a Vatican spokesman, earlier this evening the pontiff received news about the untimely death of his nephew, 12-year-old Aloysius Nicopolis. A few hours ago, the Pope submitted his resignation to the Dean of the College of Cardinals. Repeating our breaking news, Pope Clement XV... Joseph Pacelli has resigned his papacy in light of family tragedy. The plan is in motion. Tomorrow, the College of Cardinals will select Sordeo's stooge as the new pope. Next week, bombs will start exploding in places of worship. I can't let this happen. It's a good thing I'm in Rome. Wait, how did you know I was here? We've been watching your girlfriend for some time. We think she is tied to... An arrow the size of a small harpoon crashed through the window and sunk up to its feathers in Sister Judith's eye. Her hand squeezed around her coffee cup, shattering it. A second arrow hit her in the forehead, taking off the top of her head, her brain splattering on the wall behind her. Judith, no! Marcella, don't run by the window! The arrow hit Marcella crosswise in her head. It entered the left side and stuck out on the right. Marcella's legs folded under her as she went down. Her eyes remained open, but there wasn't any life in them. I started to crawl out of the room and then remembered there was a DVD that Sister Judith wanted me to see. The DVD player didn't have a direct line of sight of the window, so I figured it was a safe trip back into the room. I headed out of the convent, taking care to avoid any windows. True, I didn't examine the arrows, but 
What are the odds of there being two demonic archers and me running into both of them? Well, actually, those are probably better than even odds. Still, I was convinced that, somehow, Lash's archer had followed me from the States. I was at a gas station that had closed hours ago. My heart was in my throat and my fists were closed so tightly that my fingernails cut into the palm of my hands. I had taken the caddy out of the convent's yard, expecting an attack that never came. Now I was watching the DVD Sister Judith was going to show me. I could not wrap my mind around what I was seeing. The video was grainy, as if there weren't enough light for the crappy cell phone camera they were using to film this. This torture. The date stamp was two weeks ago. The picture came up on a room made of stone. A table and chair were placed over a pentagram lined with something wet and greasy. Holy oil. There was enchanted writing on the walls along with crucifixes and other religious icons. This was a room of protection. Magic of any type would be useless in here. Get your hands off me, you little pervert! Oh! Bitch! Watch your tongue, harlot. The altar boy chained Carmen to the table. Her hair was matted and torn out. Carmen's left eye was blackened and purple bruises covered her body. Her shirt was in tatters. It looked as if she hadn't eaten in days, but her eyes were still defiant. I don't know what you want me to do. You want me to get Harry? Fine. Let me go and I'll see if I can work you into his schedule. His slap drew blood from her mouth, which she spit at him. Oh, you're such a big man. I'll make you a deal, Acolyte. Untie me. If you can hit me once, just once, I'll drive you to Harry and convince him to come with you. Of course, we both know you won't be able to lift your hands before I've ripped off your nuts and fed them to the squirrels. The altar boy lit a fire in what looked like a giant bird bath. Then he opened a kit of tools and placed them on the table in front, but out of reach of Carmen. He examined each tool, showing it to Carmen, then the camera. A vice grip came first. He opened and closed it twice. A few fireplace pokers were placed pointy end first into the fire. Next, he held a ball-peen hammer and an awl. The final tool was a pair of rusty pliers. What are you planning to do with those? Brother Sordeo finds these to be useful tools for extraction. Most people only last a few hours before they are telling Sordeo anything he wants to hear. In your case, though... In my case, what? (laughs) You have nothing Brother Sordeo wants to extract. He just wants to send a message to Strange. The film cut and jumped ahead. Someone was standing between Carmen and the camera. I was guessing Sordeo. What's that? You'll have to enunciate your words better. Look at that. Some of my best work. And your lips aren't even bleeding. Acolyte, even though this room is magic proof, sewing her lips together assures us that she cannot speak any of her vile magic. Now, harlot, what do you think? Shall we test to see if you are a witch? You know, in the old days, they would do the fire test. They took a hot poker like this one and jammed it into the chest of the accused. If she were innocent, God would protect her, and the metal wouldn't burn. No! 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 If she were guilty, however... If only Harry Strange were here, this would all stop. But he has forsaken you. Perhaps when he sees this video, he will know how serious I am. Son of a bitch was torturing Carmen just to get my attention. I thought back to my office in Night Falls. There must have been a dozen DVD shippers in my mail. How long had this been going on? What did Carmen have to endure because of me? On the screen, Sordeo was was using the vice grips. Let's just leave it at that. I hit the eject button. Okay, Sordeo, you want me? You got it. I'm coming for you very soon. You won't know when, but I know you're not going to be the least bit happy about my arrival. Harry Strange, episode 213, Mark 13, verses 32-33, was written and directed by Tony Serechia. All material is copyright by Tony Serechia and used with his permission. Featured in tonight's cast were Kellen Stennett, Julie Ivey, Brian Troxell, Dennis Coburn, 
Parker Worling, Tricia Groves, Emily Jane, Katherine Claypool, Craig Johnston, and Sylvia Galan. To keep up with the latest news and information on everyone's favorite private investigator, visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash harrystrangeradio. Send your questions, comments, and suggestions to producer at harrystrange.com. For comments that may be included on future shows, call the listener hotline at 678-379-8669. That's 678-379-TONY. Harry's opening theme music was written and performed by Lance Hogan and is copyrighted by Lance Hogan and used with his permission. Incidental music and character themes were written and performed by Ryan Lassard and are copyrighted by Ryan Lassard and used with his permission. Contact Ryan at rlassardmusic at gmail.com. Incidental music was written and performed by Kevin McLeod and is copyrighted by Kevin McLeod and used with his permission. Visit incompetech.com for more of Kevin's music. Our marketing and PR director is Vanessa Schill. Email Vanessa at producer at harrystrange.com. For the Harry Strange Radio Drama, I am Joanne Pruden. Good night.